Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome back to our final session in our Revelation series, actually survey. And this morning we're looking at chapters 19, 20, 21, 22. And in our last session, we considered the character of the one who's going to play the Antichrist, He was a man from the past. He's a man that's recognized from the past. And he was dead at the time that John was writing this. He also saw the judgment of the harlot church, mystery Babylon that sits on the seven hills room. And chapter 19 now begins with great rejoicing in heaven because of the judgment of the harlot church. Many martyrs are in heaven because of this system. In fact, history claims about 50 million were put to death by this church. And that's the low estimate, actually. But chapter 19 proceeds into the marriage supper. And then the return from the marriage supper to Armageddon. And then proceeding into the millennium, the great white throne judgment and then into eternity. So anyway, we begin with this rejoicing in heaven in chapter 19, verse 1 and 2. And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. And may the Lord give us the spirit of revelation as we're looking at the book of Revelation here. For true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. Well, heaven is rejoicing because of the judgment that came upon the city on seven hills, the harlot church. And now we're moving into the next scene, which is the marriage supper, and um bear in mind that the church has been here for the whole of the seven-year period. And also bear in mind that part of the church has been pretty much protected during that last three-and-a-half-year period. Great tribulation takes place during the last three-and-a-half years. We covered that in chapter 12. But the part of the church that is being protected would be those that are in the holy place It seems to be those in the outer court, the remnant that are being purified through different judgments. And, of course, um, they haven't allowed God to do that work in their hearts, and so it's, it's being done during that time period. They haven't advanced beyond the salvation experience. But now we come to the marriage supper, and I must emphasize that this supper is far more exclusive than what is being preached today. This is not a come-as-you-are party. Um, but looking at verse 7, 19, 7, and 8. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Now, note from these two verses here, the bride hath made herself ready. And again, this is not come as you are banquet. And so this applies to those who are living and, of course, to those who've already passed on because all of those that are going to have a part of this have prepared themselves through life. And uh, they have on the proper wedding attire. In fact, we see this in the Psalms, and it says that she's all glorious within. To God has done a work in her life. Psalm 45. You know, when Jesus gives the illustration of the marriage supper in Matthew 25... 
This is to serve as a warning and as a caution to the church because five of the virgins were not prepared and they didn't enter into this banquet. They were saved, they were pure, but they were unprepared. And we need to live with eternity in view. Amen? We need to see the future here. You know, the Apostle Paul said, if I might by any means attain unto the, uh, actually the phrase is out resurrection from among the dead. He wanted to be a part of those that would reign in the millennium. Not all Christians are going to be. But Paul knew that he wouldn't be alive at the time. And he said, if I might by any means have a part of this event. Paul wanted to be a part of the 1,000-year reign of Christ upon earth. Now, that little phrase, if I might by any means, does that sound like passivity? Like we're all going up? No, it's talking about somebody who is really applying himself in every measure that he might be counted worthy to be a part of that. And you could note Philippians 3.11. Many of the saints do not receive their body until the great white throne judgment, which is at the end of the thousand year reign of Christ. And, um, but, you know, they were not privileged to reign during that period of time. But those who return with Christ are overcomers. Amen. And the scripture is very clear upon that. In fact, we covered that in Revelation 17, 14. But these are overcomers that are with him, that are going to reign upon earth. This is not just people that have a deathbed repentance, but um, we'll cover that more thoroughly when we get to chapter 20. But continuing on here in verse 9, 19, 9, And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Now, as Jesus often said, many are called. What's the rest of it? Few are chosen. Many are called, few are chosen. Uh, but as I said, most of the church world today kind of takes this at a, as a given. Just, you know, give your heart to Christ, you're in the kingdom and everybody's going up. That's really not the way it is. Many are called, and the invitation goes out to all of the church, but not everybody in the church is going to have a part of this. Many parables substantiate this, and just for an example, Luke 14, 16 through 24, many were invited to this supper. They all had excuses, they all had other things to do. No time to prepare. And in the last verse there in 1424. For I say unto you that none of those which were bidden shall taste of my supper. Remember, many are invited to this banquet, but not everybody's going to attend. Not necessarily being lost, but they're not going to have a part of the most exclusive banquet that has ever been upon earth. Uh, this is in heaven, I'm sorry. I'm saying it. The invitation is to those on earth, but of course uh, the banquet is in heaven. Um, but let me just emphasize this again. Getting saved is not the prerequisite to have a part of this marriage banquet. We have to have a vision. We have to fight the good fight of faith. We have to run the race It's a fight of faith. Amen? So there has to be a personal overcoming if we want to be a part of this banquet in heaven. And just quoting, I'm jumping ahead here to Revelation 20 and verse 6 for a minute. It says, Blessed and holy is he that hath part of the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no part, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years, blessed and holy. 
And not all of the redeemed have a part of this. And many are not resurrected until the end of the millennium. They're in heaven, but they don't get a body back until the end of the millennium. And so continuing here, 1910. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not, I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And the messenger here that's giving this revelation to John was a fellow saint. And you see this a few times in Revelation, where it was a fellow saint. Called an angel, but fellow saint. Okay, now we come to Armageddon. Because the next part of this revelation needs a little explaining. And we're looking at two separate events. And oftentimes this is preached as a compound event. The marriage supper and Armageddon are not a compound event. There's a marriage supper in heaven. The Lord returns from that supper. And Armageddon takes place at that time. And... um, You know, there's an army that's gathered there that the Lord has called there for the purpose of removing them, wiping them out. Okay, so we're looking at a separate event. The Lord is coming back from the marriage supper with his armies in heaven. And, you know, unfortunately, that's the way scripture is. I mean, one comma can separate 2,000 years. You see that in Luke Chapter, actually, I could give you a verse here uh, in Luke four eighteen through 20, where Jesus is using, he, he's quoting from Isaiah, but he stops on a comma. He doesn't finish the rest of it because you're taking a 2,000-year jump, and that's the way scripture is. But, um, so the catching up of The church to the supper is one event, and the return from the supper is another event. And, uh, of course, uh, when he returns, that is when Armageddon takes place. I mean, many times you hear it preached that this is a compound event. So the Lord is coming for his church. The church is going up. And then we see the Lord returning. It looks like it's one event, but it's actually two different events. And I believe there's about a 30-day gap in between, and I'll explain that a little bit later. Okay, so now we see the riders on white horses, and this is a return from the supper, 1911. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. And verse 14, And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should Smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of and wrath of Almighty God. And then dropping down to 19. And I saw the beast, the Antichrist, and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. Verse 20, the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These were both cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. Verse 21, and the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. 
you get a pretty good picture of this in Ezekiel 38. But um, there are three dates that we have to reconcile. I believe we've been through this before, but there's the 1260, 1290, and 1335. And so remember from chapter 12, The Great Tribulation begins, the woman is protected for 1260. That's three and a half years. In fact, it's exactly three and a half years. The Hebrew calendar is a solar calendar. It's 360 days in a year. It's exactly, um, 1260 is exactly half of the seven-year period of time. And so it's the last half. The woman is protected. Part of the remnant are persecuted during that time. The next state that's mentioned comes from Daniel chapter 12 and verse 11. We see the 1290 days. That's a 30-day gap. And the image of the Antichrist is removed at 1290. There's a 30-day gap here. And we're suggesting to you, well, I believe it's right, at 1260, the church goes up. This is the very end of the seven-year period. 30 days later, the Lord returns Armageddon. The Antichrist is destroyed, and his image is removed from the temple. He's put his temp- his image in the temple there in Jerusalem. And... So it seems as though the marriage supper is about a 30-day event. Um, But then also, um, I want to just inject this too, because the marriage supper is not just a banquet, not just a celebration, but it's a time of recognition. People are going to be recognized. Uh, There's going to be certain awards given. And it's kind of an orientation, too, because this supper is uh, preparing the overcomers that have qualified what they're going to do when they come back down on earth. They're given certain positions. Have thou rule over five cities. Have thou rule over ten cities. And so the marriage supper is not just a celebration, but there's merits, achievements given, and the Lord is going to uh, give certain, you know, um, positions. Uh, and so it's an orientation as well. They're not coming down, returning from that banquet blank, well, we don't know what we're doing. They, they're going to know exactly, everybody who comes back is going to know exactly what he's to do, what part of the earth he's having a dominion over or whatever, because the Lord is setting up his government upon earth. I hope I made that plain. Um, Now the last 45 days, 1335, comes from Daniel 12.12. Blessed is those who wait for this particular time period. This is another 45-day extension from Armageddon. And so this last date takes us to the battle of uh, outside of Jerusalem in the Valley of Jehoshaphat. I've been through that valley a few times. But this last battle is where uh, the, the armies from the north have been destroyed. But now, after the Antichrist is removed, it seems to be a little blank period here. And the armies from the east, looks like they're Muslim armies, come to Jerusalem into the Valley of Jehoshaphat. And the Lord appears at that time and tells Jerusalem to have, I mean, half the city has fallen, actually. And the Lord stands on the Mount of Olives and gives dominion to Israel to, you know, take care of their enemies at that time. And that begins the millennium. But there's another 45-day extension from the Battle of Armageddon to the Valley of Jehoshaphat. I uh, hope I've made that clear. But... That is really the last battle. Armageddon is not the, the very last battle, but the Valley of Jehoshaphat is the very last skirmish before the millennium begins. The Lord stands 
on the Mount of Olives at that time and gives dominion to his to natural Israel. Okay. If I haven't made that plain, you can go back and listen to this over again. But so the rapture takes place at the 1260. This is the final 1260. And then Armageddon, 1290, 30 days later. Valley of Jehoshaphat, 45 days beyond that. And that's when the Lord stands on the Mount of Olives, and that's where the millennium begins. Everybody clear on that? Anyway, that's the end of chapter 19. So let's go on to chapter 20. So after the Valley of Jehoshaphat, we see the Lord standing upon the Mount of Olives. And, of course, Israel repents at that time. They see the wounds in his hands, and they repent as a nation. They realize they have crucified, or they did crucify their Messiah. And then Satan is cast into hell for a thousand years. And also all of the unclean spirits that are upon earth are removed as well. They go down into the lower parts as well. And you can see this in Zechariah 13.2, if you want to note that. All of the unclean spirits are removed from the earth at that time. They're all taken down. And it's interesting because, you know, man blames everything on the devil. In fact, you ever see anybody with a, a tattoo on their arm that says, the devil made me do it? We, we can blame everything on the devil but there's still the flesh that um, we have to contend with. Now, the battle isn't going to be quite as severe in the millennium, but remember, there are mortals here during the millennium, and there are nations here that still do not um, want to submit to the rule of Christ, but they're going to have to. Um, There's still rebellion here, and... Still works of the flesh, and you could note Isaiah 65 and verse 20. But continuing on here, and we're looking at verse 1 through 3. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan and bound him a thousand years. During the whole course of the millennium, Satan and his cohorts are bound, cast into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. And the reason for that is because there are still Nations, unrepentant nations on the, the earth that uh, he's that are going to be deceived to actually come against Christ and his saints in the holy city. And at that time, they're destroyed. But we have to realize, too, that our arch enemy is here. There's a purpose. God could remove him like that, but he's here to test the saints. And um, he has one more stint at the end of the millennium because there is still rebellion. Even though things are quite subdued, all of the nations have to submit to the government of Christ, and some of them are not too happy about it. And you get a little picture of this in Zechariah chapter 14, verses 16 through 19. Because during the millennium, all the nations have to come up to Jerusalem and keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Those who do not come up, no rain on their land and other plagues. So there's still resistance, even in the millennium. Okay. And so Satan is released at the end of the thousand years, verses 7 through 10. And he provokes all of the goat nations those who are not happy with the reign of Christ and his government, and they come against Jerusalem, the holy city, and then you see the final 
Well, this isn't a battle. It's just a wipeout. And then after this wipeout of these evil people, we see the white throne judgment. And then eternity. So in the millennium, there are mortals and there are immortals. And there are Christians that did not qualify for the marriage supper. Some of them live out uh, a time in the millennium. They die. There are others who are converted during the millennium. They're still preaching. There's still churches during the millennium. And at the end of the thousand-year period, and after this wipeout that we just mentioned, all are going to be judged at the great white throne judgment. Then comes the great white throne judgment. And so looking at verse 5, But the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. We want to be a part of the first resurrection. Paul wanted to be a part of the first resurrection. Verse 6, Blessed and holy is he that hath a part in the first resurrection. This is at the second coming. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. So what's the qualification for the first resurrection? Blessed and holy, that's right. Blessed and holy. And as we said, there's longevity on earth during the millennial period. People live uh, for hundreds of years. It's kind of like going back before the flood. Um, And it says a sinner shall die at 100 years old, being a child. Oh, he's just a kid. He's only 100 years old and he died. But um, after Satan has accomplished his final mission, he's cast into hell forever. And it is interesting that the nations that join with him are the same goat nations that you see today. And Gog and Magog are mentioned basically Russia and Turkey and in that area. And um, it's the same people that, same nations that hate God today, hate Christ, that continue on with that hatred even during the millennium. So now we're coming to the end of the millennium, the end of the thousand-year period of time. Verse 9, and... Here are the nations coming against the holy city. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and false prophet are. And they shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. For eternity. Now comes the great white throne judgment. For everyone who has ever lived is judged, of course, with the exemption of those who were a part of the first resurrection. Verse 11 and 12. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose faith the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And verse 15, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So all who did not qualify for the first resurrection or were converted during the millennium are going to be judged at that time. Every mortal that has ever lived from Adam and the sea gives up her dead and every mortal that has ever lived will be at this white throne judgment. 
with the exemption of those who qualified to be a part of the first resurrection. And they're not going to be judged because they've already been uh, deemed blessed and holy. They've already passed the test. So they're not judged uh, at that time. It is only those, uh, there are uh, saints and there are the wicked that are judged at the great white throne judgment. Are we clear on that? Okay. So whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Well, that's the end of chapter 20. Let's go into chapter 21. And chapter 21 follows the sequence here from chapter 20. So after the great white throne judgment, John sees a new heaven and a new earth. And when we say new heaven, we're not talking about the city of heaven. We're talking about atmospheric heaven. Okay, the celestial heaven. No pollution in it. New earth and a new sky. The new heavens, all right? We're not talking about the new city of heaven. Um, but it's atmospheric, atmospheric heaven. Celestial heaven. No pollution. And this present earth passes into time and space. And remember, hell is in the center of this earth. And then John sees the city of heaven coming down and resting upon the new earth. And not all of God's people are going to dwell within the city itself. I think that's kind of an exclusive privilege. But many of God's people will live on the new earth. And, by the way, there's much activity on the new earth. And people that have had visions have seen, you know, agriculture and things like that. But there's a lot of activity. Many of the redeemed live on the new earth. Others live in the city itself. So we're in verse 1, 21, 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. So the Lord now has a people he can dwell with, he can walk with, he wipes away all their tears from the past, and in this place there's more death or sorrow or pain. And um, going on to verse 4 and 5, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. It's well worth being faithful to be a part of this. Amen? Because the overcomer inherits all things. We inherit Christ himself. And we will be his true sons and daughters. And verse 7. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. I will be his God. He shall be my son. Now take note of verse 8. And there are reasons why there are a few tears in heaven. We'll cover that. But in verse 8, But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. I made a side note here, and I'm trying to read what it says. But the fearful, you know, those who are ashamed of Christ. And please remember this, that the world goes to hell for rejecting Christ. That's why they go to hell. And Christians go to hell for the above. A Christian cannot continue to practice sin and go to heaven. It's very clear. 
this verse and many other passages as well. So John is shown the New Jerusalem and the glorious city of heaven. And there are a few metaphors here that picture the city of heaven, pictured as a bride, a glorious bride coming down in verses 9 through 11. And also, the city is described as being four square. And, and to put it in our terms today, it would be 1,500 miles square. And also 1,500 miles high. Now, um, it also has 12 gates. They must be spread out pretty good, what, about 500 miles apart or something? <laughs> And the city, but uh, has twelve gates, and those gates are all named. They all have the names of the twelve uh, patriarchs, tribes of Israel, the twelve tribes. And Pastor Bailey made this remark concerning the redeemed of Israel that they're all going to go through a particular gate. Those who are going into heaven. They go through a particular gate. And um, he further remarks that we also will go through a particular gate into the city. So there has to be a certain spiritual connection with these tribes as well, or vision. And these gates going into the city are made of pearl. Now, you know how a pearl is produced through great suffering. And those who enter this city have paid a certain price. Okay, is that plain enough? They paid a certain price. And the city is also described as having 12 foundations, and upon the 12 layers are the names of the 12 apostles. In verse 14, And so these 12 foundations are garnished with particular gems, which all relate to the 12 apostles. But do you see the beautiful relationship here between natural Israel and spiritual Israel? Natural Israel, their names, 12 patriarchs, are on the gates of the city. And underneath the city, we see the 12 apostles. But there's a Beautiful relation between the spiritual Israel and and natural Israel here. Looking at verse 16. And the city lieth four square, and the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with the reed 12,000 furlongs. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. Um. As we said, that 12,000 furlongs is 1,500 miles. But verse 16 is kind of interesting because the height of the city is also 1,500 miles. Now, the walls aren't 1,500 miles going up there because it tells us uh, the height of those walls a little bit later here. But uh, I would suggest from uh, several things from the height of the city. Uh, Firstly, because uh, the scripture mentions three heavens. Okay, Paul said he was in the third heaven. And also the pattern of the tabernacle, which is a shadow of heavenly things. The outer court, of course, is much larger than the holy place. And when you get to the Holy of Holies, it's half the size of the holy place. So I can kind of imagine heaven as having three tiers to it to make up that 1500. And of course, in heaven, I'm sure you can see, uh, it's not going to be veiled from your eyes. You can see every tier from the ground. Uh, we're in another dimension there, but... So that would be my take on it anyway. Paul said he was in the third heaven. He had revelation there. To me, that's the Mount Zion in heaven. He had revelation that he couldn't share upon earth. 
But anyway, the city of heaven spans 1,500 miles high, 1,500 miles long and wide. Okay. Everybody got that? And the walls of the city are 144 cubits. That is 12 by 12. 12 speaks of government, and those within the city have, shall we say, reigned in life. Amen? They found grace, and they have reigned in life. And then the city has the appearance of transparent gold. Now, gold in Scripture speaks of the divine nature. So the divine nature radiates from those who have fulfilled those promises given by Peter. And Peter said, we can be partakers of this divine nature. And he gives us certain precepts, doesn't he, in Second Peter. But um, let me just quote a verse here from Second Peter. And chapter 1 and verse 4, it says, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these, by these promises, you might be partakers of the divine nature. And gold in scripture speaks of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And also note here in verse 22, 22, and I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. Now on earth, that temple procedure was necessary because, you know, to perfect the saint, the washings, the sacrifice, the intercession, through the means of, you know, the temple, or the church, uh, to perfect us to God, but You know, in heaven, those that are there are perfected. And there's no longer any need for mediation in heaven. Are you with me here? And so God has accepted us through Christ, and he can walk with us, talk with us, and there's no need for a temple there. I mean, uh, we can worship him, you know, from wherever we're at. But he's accepted us as his true sons and daughters. There's no need for the sun because the glory of God lightens the atmosphere of heaven. And let's go on to verse 24. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. Kings of the earth shall bring their glory and honor into it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day For there shall be no night there, and they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And so once again, you know, many nations are on the the new earth. Not everybody lives in a city. And here's an example of this. They're bringing their riches and treasures into the city. And even agricultural products, as far as that goes, too. I think you get a little picture of this in the millennium. Because in Isaiah 60, in verse 11, uh, you see the gates being opened day and night and the nations bringing their treasures into the city. Okay, let's continue here with our last verse in this chapter, verse 27. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination, or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. And so, that's why we must preach the gospel to every creature. Uh, That's what I appreciate about our fellowship. Uh, We we travel throughout the the world. Uh, There's still nations, though, that I'd like to see our church get into. Uh... I think, uh, have you been to nations I haven't been to, Pastor Frank? Uh, I think so, yes. Because I think we have, our church has touched, the last I looked, I think we had something close to 40 nations that we have been to. 
Um, I know I myself have been to at least 30 nations, I mean, for the purpose of preaching, but um, where? I've been to Poland, but not to preach. (laughs) So you've been there. You've preached in Poland. Okay. Very good. Um, But we must preach the gospel to every creature, and especially in these last days. Remember, the everlasting gospel goes out to all people. People will make a choice. So that's one of the releases from heaven. In the last days, the everlasting gospel is preached. So we still have a little bit of time left, but it's going to be with great power that it has to take place. So only those written in the Lamb's Book of Life are going to be in heaven. And we want to get as many people there as possible. Amen. Okay, last chapter. We have reached our final chapter. So, in the onset of this chapter, John continues with some of the wonders and splendors of heaven. And first of all, he's shown that river flowing from the throne. And on both sides of this crystal clear river is the tree of life with 12 different fruits coming forth every month. Now, one for every month. So there has to be some measure of time in heaven. Uh, There's no end to eternity, but there must be some measure of time if there's going to be a fruit for every month, 12 months. There has to be uh, some kind of a measure, some kind of a calendar in heaven uh, I wonder what it will look like a million years from now, being in heaven. What year would that be? Uh, we'd run out of zeros, right? Um, anyway, uh, this river flowing from the throne reminds us of the river flowing from the millennial temple. Remember Christ sitting in the temple during the millennium, and there's a river flowing out. Everything that this river touches lives. And Christ wants that river, of course, flowing from us, too. Amen? Um, We want that prophetic river. We want that healing river flowing from us. And just to note, John 7, 38. Okay, let's pick up in verse 1, 22, 1. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it and on either side of the river, there was a tree of life which bare 12 manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Now, I think initially there will need to be some healing of God's people. Now, as previously mentioned, he wipes away the tears from the eyes of his people. Why would there be tears in heaven? Well, I think one big reason is this. When people get to heaven and realize that they didn't fulfill everything that God had for them to do, there's going to be tears. When they see where they should have been, but they're not there. When they see the mansion that perhaps should have been theirs, And God, you know, replace them with somebody else. I think there'll be a lot of tears from people that did not fulfill what they were called to do here during this life. And that's why we want to fulfill everything that God has for us. Not everybody's going to be a missionary or fivefold ministry or whatever. But we all have a certain call upon our life. If it's just being faithful in a smaller, um, part of the church, but um, we want to be faithful in what God has given us to do. Amen? So we can say, you know, maybe God only gave us a talent, but let's be faithful with the, the one talent. You want more talents, that means you're going to be more responsible and you have to answer for more when you get up there, right? Well, I want five talents. Well, if you're going to answer for it, then 
How about ten talents? You're going to answer for that, too. Um, but you'll answer for what God has given you to do. All right? Um, and then, two, um, you know, I believe that there's going to be a few tears in heaven when people realize part of their family isn't there. Maybe all of their family isn't there. Maybe there's friends that should have been there that aren't there. I think there'll be a few tears there, too. Uh, but the Lord promises to mollify the memory of people on those situations in chapter 21 and verse 4. But I want to be in heaven, don't you? In verse 3, there's no more curse. In verse 4, we shall see his face. In verse 5, there's no night there. No more darkness, no more pain, no more curse. And here's John's commission. Here's the saint who is bringing this to John. And he said unto me, These sayings are the faithful and true, are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servant the things which must shortly be done. And so John is given a revelation. He's given this revelation for the purpose of showing this to the church. I mean, that's what we're doing today. And we as ministers are given this commission to, you know, commit this to the church. And, you know, perhaps even more so because we're coming into the time zone. We're coming into the time zone when all of this is going to start to be reality. And we're not that far off, folks, because as Jesus said, he's talking about the fig tree coming back to life, which took place in 1947. Actually, I was alive at that time. Um, he said, this generation shall not completely pass away until all of this is fulfilled. So those who've been alive since the time of Israel, the rebirth of Israel, will live to see the fulfillment of everything here. So we're coming into the closeout of an age. Amen? It's 2,000 years essentially given to the church age. Um, in verse 7, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And I, John, saw these things and heard them, and when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel, which shewed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. So again, I hear you see this a few times where this angel turns out to be one of the fellow saints from the past. Who knows? It could have been Daniel, the prophet. It could have been one of the prophets from yesteryear. Um, verse 10 and 11, And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. Now, the truths of Revelation have relevance for every generation. Uh, there's always been the righteous and the wicked, but in these last days, everything is coming to fruition, to ripeness. We're all, the church is getting ripe. The world is getting ripe. Everything is coming to full ripeness. Now, just to clarify something in verse 11, the verb tense here should go something like this. He that is unjust, let him become more unjust still. He that is filthy, let him become more filthy still. He that is righteous, let him become more righteous still. He that is holy, let him become more holy still. Okay, that's the way that verb tense reads. All right? So, in these last days, 
The wicked are becoming more wicked, and you can even see that. But God wants his people to become more righteous and more holy. Amen? Everything is ripening up. Verse 12. Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. And then we have the final warnings and exhortation. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates of the city, to the city. Now, the Apostle John said this. Those who say they know God but don't keep his commandments are liars. And let me just quote this uh, from 1 John 2, 4. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. You know, you hear it preached today, we're not under the law, we don't have to keep... Listen, folks, Christ came with higher commandments, higher law. The new covenant is higher than the old covenant. And we want to keep the commandments of Christ, the higher commandments. And there's grace to do that, too. Amen? People that say they know God but break all of the commandments are, are not the true followers. So as Christians, we have to keep the higher commandments of Christ, and that's what grace is all about. Because grace gives us the power to do what we can't do in our own strength. Now, again, we have a list of sins. Maybe not complete, but these sins keep people out of heaven. You know, there are sins that are not unto death, and there are sins unto death. And this really is to God's people here, because, uh, as we said, the world goes to hell for rejecting Christ, but Christians go to hell for some of these sins here. Verse 15, for without our dogs, some translate that as homosexuals, and sorcerers, drug addicts, the word is pharmakia, means drugs, whoremongers, murderers, idolaters, and whatsoever, whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. So, in the final warning of this book, there's a caution to any that would remove anything that's written in this book. The Lord said, if anyone takes anything out of this book, I'll take him out of the book of life. Verse 17, And the spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, let him that is athirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. So the invitation still goes out. The water of life still flows out to all that are athirst. As Christ said to the woman at the well, If any thirst, let him come unto me and drink. And, you know, this woman was, she had a spiritual thirst, and the Lord had something that could quench her thirst, his spirit. And if we drink of this water, we shall never thirst again. And so that's what we're here for as a church. We want to invite many people to partake of the water of life and to fulfill everything God has for us, everything that God has appointed us for. Well, we know we're in the lowest time in our history here, but we've been around long enough to see the ebb and flow of revival. Things get very low. Uh, It almost looks like the church is over and then God moves and boom, then you don't know where to put people. And things are going to change. Folks, so be encouraged. Um, I remember one time during the 60s, I just said, this is it. It's over. And the church was so bad, so low, so few. I thought, this is the end. Boom. Charismatic movement began. The church was full again. Um, Verse 20, he which testify of these things, saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. 
So there you have John's revelation. And as we said, we are fast approaching this time period and this time zone. We want to be watchful. We want to be prayerful. We want to be faithful. We want to be good witnesses and uphold the standard. Many people let down the standard just to have people. We don't want to do that. But God will honor those who uphold his standards. Amen. We want to be faithful. Um, You know, people, sometimes you witness to them. They hate you. They avoid you. But in eternity, those who turned away your witness, I wonder what kind of regrets they're going to have in hell. I wish I'd have listened. And then there'll be others there that will say, I'm so glad I listened to that person. Um, Well, let's be true witnesses. Amen?